Good Sunday morning to you. I'm glad that you are joining me in worship this day. My name is Jennifer Jaimez and I serve St. Mark's United Church of Christ in Bloomington. I, along with Scott Seifert, our intern, welcome you to worship this day. I pray that this service feeds your spirit in life-giving ways as we go throughout our days. It's this service as well as all our other worship services can be found either on our Facebook page or our website or our YouTube channel located under St. Mark's UCC Bloomington. We will be holding our annual meeting February 7th at 10 a.m. via Zoom. This is one week from today. I will be delivering or mailing annual reports for those who are unable to pick them up at the church. Please let me know if you need an annual report and have not yet received one. We encourage you to set aside next Sunday at 10 a.m. for this annual meeting. If you are not able to join us via Zoom, please contact me and we will figure out a way for you to participate. With all that being said, I invite you to take a breath in and a breath out so that you can prepare your heart and mind for worship this day. If you have a bulletin, please join in the call to worship. Otherwise, I invite you to hear these words. For people in darkness, Christ is the light. For people in despair, Christ is the hope. For people grieving, Christ is a comfort. For people burdened, Christ is a friend to share the load. For people anxious, Christ is calm assurance. For all people, Christ is for you. For everyone gathered, even virtually, hear the call to follow Christ and walk in his ways. For all in this time, let your praise arise. Let us join our voices in the opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Dan?
stand. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of life and breath, for the gift of gathering this day. Bless us as we hear your words. Open our hearts and minds and souls to what you would say to us. Strengthen us and nurture us. And then send us out to answer your call to be disciples. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another in the prayer of confession. Again, if you have a bulletin, please join in. Otherwise, I invite you to hear this prayer of confession. Searcher of hearts, you know us from the beginning. You see in us more good and beauty than we have dared to believe. You beckon us to do more than we have dared to try. Forever you call our names but we have filled our ears with the sounds of the world. We have timidly spoken of your great love. We have doubted the gifts hidden within each of us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Forgive us. I invite you to a time of silent confession. Amen. Searcher of hearts, shine your forgiving light into our hesitancy and embolden us to live with such joy and fire that all the world may know of your love. Let us truly hear the good news that in Christ we are forgiven. This is good news indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are a loved and forgiven people, and because of that, we can have peace in our hearts. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with those nearby with a handshake or embrace, or if you are by yourself this day, give yourself a hug. Alone or together, may we all feel the peace of Christ fill our hearts. Good morning. Now is the time for the children's message, so all the young people, please come up, get closer to the screen. Those young physically, those young at heart, all of us that feel young, please get closer to the screen for this message today. I'm so glad to be here. I have an older brother. His name's Brad. And, you know, when we were kids, we'd get together and we would, uh, you know, create games. We would do all kinds of things. One game I remember in particular we called bat ball. It was kind of like take this ball and it lost air and then we'd also play baseball, which I'm not sure everybody knows what that is yet, but you probably will. Um, but I, we'd throw this deflated ball and hit it. And then we'd run around the bases just like baseball. But there was only two of us, so we'd have to make up different rules. So we made one where you could get somebody out by throwing the ball at them and hitting them. And as we're doing these games like this, we'd always have, you know, disagreements kind of or negotiation or, you know, just kind of working together to try to make it fair for everybody. So sometimes Brad would say, let's do this. And I'd say, that's not fair. I'm smaller than you. Or I'd say, let's do this. And he'd go, that's not fair or that's not going to make the game better. And then we'd have to talk it out and make the rules ourselves. So one time I was rounding the bases and Brad threw the ball really hard and hit me right in the face and it hurt. You know, like you could probably see this red splotch on my face and I was crying and I was going, yeah, why'd you do that? You know, and I was not happy at all. So Brad, I could tell, you know, could, felt bad about it because he wasn't trying to hit it, hurt his little brother. So we made a new rule and we changed the rules so that, um, you weren't allowed to throw it and hit somebody in the face because just that wasn't cool. That wasn't keeping each other safe. The story we're about to hear from the scripture today has to do with rules. One of the major, one of the rules of the Ten Commandments that was always passed down was the rule of the Sabbath to keep it holy. And because of that, 
people would worship on the Sabbath and they wouldn't do any work and they wouldn't in in over time these rules got tighter and tighter and tighter so that you could only do certain things but Jesus wanted to help people on the Sabbath or if you were hungry you should be able to do something to eat or if uh, somebody needed to be healed you should be able to heal somebody because Jesus knew the greatest commandment the greatest rule that comes from him is to love God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself and that this rule was more important than all the other rules so you always had to kind of go from that So, I hope that we are able to learn from Jesus about what is important in life and what rules are important. And that rules are important, that people are around you to help keep you safe and that you should follow what they say and follow the rules because they can be very important. But also to remember the greatest rule, to love God, yourself, and your neighbor. Let us pray. God of love, help us to be faithful in following the teaching we learn from those who keep us safe. Help us to learn from the teachings we get from Jesus. He t teaches us and shows us how to follow the example of loving and caring for others. Help us to follow the rule of love that Jesus taught us. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate of the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. He got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life? Or to destroy it. After looking around at all of them, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, during those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose twelve of them whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This ends today's reading. Many of us have learned the Ten Commandments when we were very young and in Sunday school. How many of them can you name right now off the top of your head? Can you name all ten? Can you name them in the right order? One way to think about them is that the first four relate to our relationship with God, and the last six relate to our relationship with one another. 
The Ten Commandments are found in both the 20th chapter of Exodus and they are found again in the 5th chapter of Deuteronomy, both contained within the Older Testament, the Torah. It is said that today most adults can name more ingredients in McDonald's Big Mac than they can the Ten Commandments. Do you think that's true? The Ten Commandments are often understood, portrayed solely as prohibitions, as restrictions, often as burdens. Do this, but don't do this, or that, or that, or that. Bill Waterston, who created the characters Calvin and Hobbes, wrote a strip where Calvin asks his mom, Mom, can I drive on the way back? Of course not, Calvin. Can I just steer then? I promise I won't crash. No, Calvin. Can I work the gas and brakes while you steer? No, Calvin. Calvin finally responds, you never let me do anything. At times we are like Calvin. God, can I worship work or power or money? No. Can I tell untrue things about my neighbors then? No. Can I at least covet my neighbor's kitchen? No. Gee, God, you never let me do anything. We don't always like rules. We don't always or often or some of us never like to be told no. The pandemic has brought to light many things about ourselves and our nation, some really good and some not so much. Since last March, we have heard messages about the importance of wearing a mask, the importance of social distancing. We have heard warnings about the importance of not gathering in large crowds or even gathering as families. And since March, many have complied, trusting the science, trusting that we are showing care for others and ourselves as we face this unfamiliar and frightening virus of which we are still learning about. But there have also been many who refuse to comply in wearing masks, regardless of whether it is a state mandate or not, regardless of whether it is a store policy, regardless of what science says. And they have gathered in large groups and publicly voiced defiance, saying that these restrictions are unconstitutional and an infringement on their freedoms. I suspect that much of this response has to do with the fact that these rules were imposed upon rather than self-determined. It is true that wearing a mask is not the most comfortable thing to do. It is true that not being able to gather with friends and family, not gathering as a church community has been difficult. This pandemic and the resulting shutdowns and closures has created record unemployment, financial hardship for millions, isolation for so many, and division within family and friends. It has been hard and it remains hard. There is no doubt about this. Yet these rules, these restrictions, these mandates, these thou shalt and thou shalt not, we're not created out of thin air to make people's lives miserable or extraordinarily burdensome. They were created to save lives. They are designed to keep loved ones out of the ICU. They are designed to help slow the spread of the virus that has killed over 400,000 people in this nation alone. Wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, not gathering in large groups is an expression of love. It is a gift that we give to one another. So while mask mandates and social distancing rules are not the same, of course, as the Ten Commandments, they are both designed for doing good, not harm. The Ten Commandments are so much more than a list of do's and don'ts. They are given not as a burden, but as a gift, a blessing from God to God's people. The first four commandments are preoccupied with the awesome claims of God. And the last six commandments assert 
that human life be situated in a community of rights and responsibilities that is willed by God. It is an articulation of a way to be community. It is a way of living with God and one another in a way that values all of life, really all of creation. It is a way in which human life is intrinsically worthy of respect, in which humans are honored ends rather than just means, and in which desire is held in check for the sake of the whole community. The Ten Commandments are a way of living and loving one another and God, which leads to a full and blessed life, a life in relationship with God and one another. They not only shaped the Israelites back then, they continue to shape who we are, and they remind us of whose we are still yet today. Psalm 19, 7 through 10 says it so well. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. In this morning's reading, there are two controversies regarding the fourth commandment, Sabbath observance. The first one is about the plucking of grain on the Sabbath, and the second one is about healing on the Sabbath. Just to refresh your memory, the fourth commandment goes like this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Once again, the commandment about keeping the Sabbath is not meant to be a punishment, but rather it is a gift from God to God's people. It is a time to enjoy God's creation, a time to enjoy one another, a time to deepen one's relationship with God. This was a gift to the Israelites. It remains a gift to us today. But what is radical about this commandment, it is, it is not only a gift given to a few. It is a gift given to all, to men, to women, slave and free, resident and alien, even to the animals. Over the centuries, the rules about Sabbath observance have expanded. What is work? What is not? What is permissible? What is not? Let's dig into the text. Some of Jesus' disciples pluck grain as they walk through the fields. They're hungry, and so they gather what they need to stave off hunger. Some of the Pharisees, note that it says some and not all, some of the Pharisees ask Jesus, Why do you allow your disciples to do what is forbidden on the Sabbath? In other words, harvesting grain was considered work and therefore not allowed. I wonder if they had preferred Jesus and his disciples go hungry instead. Jesus pointedly asks them, have you not read what David did? You can read all about it in 1 Samuel 21 verses 1 through 6, but in a nutshell, David, their ancestor and king of Israel and his companions were hungry and had nothing to eat. So David entered the house of the Lord and took the bread of the presence, something only the priests were allowed to eat. And he not only ate of it, he gave some to his companions. What? This was a much bigger transgression than just picking some grain in the fields on the Sabbath. Really what Jesus is saying, if David, the chosen king of Israel, can supersede the law regarding sacred bread, then I, descended from the line of David and the son of man, can set aside rules regarding sacred 
time. Hunger, human need, is given priority over ritual observance. If that wasn't enough to cause issues with the Pharisees on another Sabbath, Jesus is in the synagogue, per his custom, and a man with a withered hand is also present. The scribes and the Pharisees watch Jesus closely to see what he will do. Will he heal the man or will he not? Note the man doesn't appeal to him for healing, yet Jesus calls him anyways. He doesn't appear to be in immediate need. Always aware of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus asks them a question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm? To save life or destroy it? It is a rhetorical question, and note, they do not respond. Note also that Jesus doesn't touch the man. He doesn't rub mud on the man's hand. Jesus simply says, stretch out your hand, and the man's hand is restored. Any act or action that restores life is permissible on the Sabbath. And that is more than enough for the scribes and the Pharisees to be filled with fury. They have been bested. What will they do about this Jesus? The two Sabbath stories expose the conflict between competing values and duties. The two issues, the duty to meet human need and the duty to observe religious traditions. Both Sabbath stories set God's command to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy in conflict with God's command to love one's neighbor, which takes precedence. Can the love of God be separated from the love of neighbor? Or is the love of neighbor an expression of our love of God? There are times when we, too, need to set aside what is proper to do what is just. Acts of mercy supersede religious law. While we no longer observe Sabbath as Jesus and his disciples did, or even as Christians did in the past, these stories give us an opportunity to think about today's religious traditions and rituals and sacred rites, traditions around who is welcome at the communion table, what music do we sing, who is allowed to become a member? What is the dress code? When is the worship service held? What does it look like? Whom does it invite? Can one drink coffee in the pews? Can one wear jeans in church? Does there even need to be pews or could there be chairs? While many of us grew up worshiping in a particular way that is still meaningful to us today, the question must be asked, do these traditions and rituals do good by widening the circle of God's love? Or do they do harm by excluding those who long to hear the good news of God's love in Christ, who long to be welcomed into Christ's church? Perhaps the question is not only what is permitted on the Sabbath, but what is required? Do we honor God on the Sabbath or any day when we neglect human need. We give thanks for these stories that cause us to reflect on our own traditions, our own sacred rites. May they be possibilities and openings to broaden God's expanse love for all God's children. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have been richly blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. I invite you to give to the mission and ministry of this church. You can donate online via PayPal or you can send a donation to the church. We thank you for your generosity. Let us now enter to enter a time of silent prayer where we lift up our joys and our concerns to God a God who truly hears each and every one of them. And after a brief time, I will then join us together in the words of the pastoral prayer. Let us pray.
Holy God, we give thanks to you for hearing all our prayers, those spoken aloud to one another and those whispered only to you in the quiet of our hearts. We give thanks that we can lift our burdens, our concerns, our worries, our fears up to you and that you know them and that you hear them and that you take them upon yourself and you lighten our burdens of care for sometimes they are so heavy. This day we especially lift up to you all who are in need of your presence, who are in need of your strength, who are in need of your comfort, who need to know that they are not alone as they struggle through this life. We pray for all of those who are dealing with COVID, who have lost family members to COVID, who are so fearful because of the new strains that are coming out and the frustration with the vaccine rollout and this continued pandemic that we are living in the midst of, for we are tired and there is many more months to go. Help us to do what is safe, Help us to show expressions of care for others in ways that we can, even when inconvenient, even when difficult. Holy God, we pray for this nation that continues to be in political turmoil and economic turmoil. We pray that people in power might make decisions for peace and we pray that each of us in our own way might make decisions for peace. We give thanks for your word, for your word that comforts us, reminds us of who we are and whose we are, and whose word challenges us. We pray that our important rites and rituals and traditions that we so love may not inhibit the welcoming of others to this gathering, to your table, to know that they too are one of your beloved children. Help us to let go of what we need to let go and embrace the new and different so that your word might be spread throughout as we too are your disciples, much as the 12 that you called. We pray for this world, O oh God, where there is fear and loss, where there is warfare, where there is oppression, in ways that we have never experienced in this country. And we pray too for the people who suffer and struggle and for the leaders who make decisions that they might work for the good of others and not to the harm. Holy God, hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught all who would follow him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join our voices in the closing hymn this day, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Dan.
Thank you, Dan. Now hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Let all God's people say, Amen. Thanks be to God. I'll see you next week.